For the first time since the early days of the Cold War, America is lagging behind its international competition in a technology race with far-reaching military and diplomatic implications. Hypersonic weapons, or weapons that travel faster than Mach 5, are one of the emerging technologies the Pentagon believes could dictate the outcome of future wars. But as America's competitors keep fielding new hypersonic missiles, America's own efforts keep failing. But is that really the whole story? Let's dive into the hypersonic arms race. I'm Alex Hollings, and this is Air Power. How is it possible that the United States, with a $700 plus billion annual defense budget, can't get a hypersonic weapon into service, while Russia's military, assigned just $61 billion last year, already has two? Well, the truth, as truths tend to be, is pretty complicated. And if I'm being honest, that question itself might misrepresent the real nature of the hypersonic arms race we now find ourselves in. You see, America led the world in hypersonic technologies all throughout the 90s and the 2000s, and even had plans for hypersonic aircraft that date all the way back to the 1950s. But the past two decades of the global war on terror forced a shift in focus, away from advancing military technologies and instead toward the large-scale employment of the stuff we already have. A lot like the F-14 Tomcat and later the F-22 Raptor, hypersonic missiles were seen as incredibly expensive weapon systems with no real threat that they were needed to counter. But now, as a new Cold War of sorts is kicking off between world powers, the Pentagon is making up for lost time in the best way that it knows how, by just throwing a whole bunch of money at the problem. In 2020, the Pentagon devoted just over $2 billion to developing hypersonic technologies, including missiles. In 2021, that number jumped to $3.2 billion, and for 2022, it jumped again to $3.8 billion. All told, there are at least 70 hypersonic programs drawing funds from this pool, and at least seven of them are for publicly disclosed hypersonic missiles. Now, these new hypersonic weapons tend to come in one of two forms, and I say new for a reason. Technically speaking, most ballistic missiles are hypersonic weapons, and really, anything that leaves the atmosphere and comes back tends to be hypersonic. Today, the only hypersonic weapons in service are known as hypersonic glide vehicles, or HGVs, and they have a lot in common with those ballistic missiles. Just like an ICBM, they are carried to a high altitude and speed atop a rocket booster. But what differentiates them from ballistic warheads is the ability to maneuver through every portion of their flight path. And that's really what makes them dangerous. They're not really any faster than an ICBM would be, they're just unpredictable, and as a result, very difficult to stop. Now, the other type of modern hypersonic weapon is called a hypersonic cruise missile, or HCM. And these things are a whole different bag of worms with a whole different science curriculum behind them. Basically, hypersonic cruise missiles work a lot like regular cruise missiles, in that they fly like an aircraft on a fairly horizontal flight path. What makes these weapons special is their ability to travel at speeds in excess of Mach 5 thanks to scramjet propulsion, which is a form of propulsion that, to date, no nation has been able to field in an operational platform of any kind. Now, a ramjet is a form of air-breathing jet engine that uses the force of the air pushing into it as you travel forward through the sky to create compression. And a scramjet works on the same basic principles, but what differentiates them is the speed in which the air can pass through them. In a ramjet, the air is slowed to subsonic velocities, whereas in a scramjet, the airflow is allowed to move through at supersonic speeds. And that's the secret sauce that lets a scramjet-powered weapon cross that hypersonic Mach 5 barrier. A ramjet might top out at around Mach 3, whereas NASA predicts scramjets could propel vehicles past Mach 15. Now, it's important to understand that not all hypersonics are created equal, and just saying you have a new hypersonic weapon isn't the same as having a new type of capability. In fact, a lot of the hypersonic arms race of today is sort of manufactured through intentional framing and maybe some real misunderstanding of the term. And when I say framing, what I mean is that this conversation is always centered specifically on hypersonic missiles, which is something America lacks and China and Russia both have in service. But if you centered the conversation around hypersonic technology, America has the resounding lead. The hypersonic barrier, as we've already discussed, is Mach 5, which is right around 3,838 miles per hour. 
The space shuttle, which started flying in 1981, would regularly exceed Mach 25, or more than 17,500 miles per hour. Now, the space shuttle may be gone, but the Air Force's X-37B reusable spacecraft continues to do that to this day. In fact, America even has private companies with hypersonic platforms, including SpaceX, Blue Origin, and Boeing. This technology is prevalent, it just doesn't have a warhead attached to the end of it. Now, that's not to say that there's no value in having a hypersonic conversation that's relegated specifically to missiles. It's just important to understand that to suggest that America lacks the technology to put a warhead on a target at these velocities would be misleading. Now, I can hear some of you thinking that this Alex Hollings guy is just making excuses for America's defense apparatus, and I understand why you're skeptical. Let me explain what I mean. All the way back in 2004, NASA's X-43A scramjet demonstrator hit Mach 9.6 in testing, and then in 2011, Boeing's B-51 Wave Rider, also a scramjet, hit Mach 5.1 for around 210 seconds. In August of that same year, DARPA's Falcon Project launched America's HTV-2 Boost Glide Vehicle, and that one hit Mach 20 during a nine-minute flight. Then in 2017, the US and Australia conducted a joint test of the high-fire scramjet missile, which reached speeds faster than Mach 8. Now that year, 2017, is also when Russia claims the world's first, quote, hypersonic weapon went into service in their KH-47 M2 Kinzel, or Dagger, as we know it in NATO nations. Now this new weapon is neither a hypersonic boost glide vehicle, nor is it a scramjet-powered cruise missile. It's really just the first stage of a short-range ballistic missile married to a new targeting apparatus and then mounted on the belly of a MiG-31, or stashed inside a Tu-22. I'm not kidding, the Kinzel really started out as the 9K720 Iskander short-range ballistic missile, which was designed in 1988. We're not exactly talking about cutting-edge stuff here. And while the United States could likely match this capability pretty quickly, there wouldn't be much in the way of strategic value in doing so. In fact, there's an argument to be made that the real value Russia got out of fielding the Kinzel wasn't in its capability, but was rather in the press coverage that it garnered, which would help boost their desperately needed foreign weapon sales. And because the Kinzel is a nuclear weapon, Russia's in the favorable position of never having to prove that it actually works. I'm not dismissing the value of this here, it was actually a really crafty play. Russia managed to garner a great deal of press attention as a cutting-edge advanced weapons producer by strapping missiles they've had around since the 80s to fighters they've had around since the 80s. I mean, there's no way around it, that's a bargain. But regardless of Russia's faux hypersonic Kinzel, it's important to note that both Russia and China have since put hypersonic boost glide vehicles into service. And despite America's previous successes in that realm, that's a capability that the U.S. has yet to match. But there might be good reason for that, too. You see, to date, the U.S. only intends to develop new conventional or non-nuclear hypersonic weapons, and from a technical standpoint, that poses way bigger challenges than nuclear ones. As you might imagine, pinpoint accuracy isn't too important for a nuclear weapon because of the relative size of their massive blast radius. But a conventional weapon, on the other hand, has a much smaller destructive yield, and as a result, has to be a lot more accurate in order to destroy its intended target. Now, that's a point that was laid out more than once in a recent Congressional Research Service report on hypersonic missiles. I'll quote it here. U.S. hypersonic weapons will likely require greater accuracy and will be more technically challenging to develop than nuclear-armed Chinese and Russian systems. Indeed, according to one expert, a nuclear-armed glider would be effective if it were 10 or even 100 times less accurate than a conventionally-armed glider due to nuclear blast effects. Both of Russia's operational hypersonic weapons, the KH-47 M2 Kinzel and the avant-garde boost glide vehicle, are nuclear. China's DF-17, on the other hand, is considered nuclear capable, but is not often openly referred to as a nuclear weapon. But its primary purpose as an anti-ship weapon is to engage aircraft carriers at distances probably greater than a thousand miles. And to date, there's just not much evidence to suggest that their targeting apparatus could pull that off with a conventional warhead. This time, I'll quote George Nakuzi, a senior engineer at the RAND Corporation who also did an analysis on hypersonic weapons. The U.S. focus relative to hypersonic weapons is on the delivery of conventional weapons, while Russia and China are more likely to use hypersonic missiles for nuclear payloads. 
And that brings us back around to that tactical versus strategic capability conversation, because many experts contend that more advanced nuclear weapons, hypersonic or otherwise, don't offer much in the way of strategic value. Any nuclear exchange would almost certainly result in a full-scale nuclear war. In other words, unless a new weapon could simultaneously wipe out all of America's heavy payload bombers, all of America's ICBM missile silos, and all of America's ballistic missile submarines, a nuke from the 1970s is just as good as one from the 2020s at ushering in the end of the world. No nation on the planet, including America, has the means to reliably intercept a whole bunch of incoming nukes, so it really doesn't matter if you launch a hypersonic boost glide vehicle or a traditional nuclear ICBM at Washington, D.C. America's strategy and the doctrine of mutually assured destruction doesn't change. And remember, strategic value only really comes from a weapon that does something so new or different that it forces your opponent to shift their strategy. To date, Russia's hypersonic weapons just don't cross that barrier. But, and there is a but here, China's do. China's hypersonic anti-ship missiles have forced a huge shift in U.S. Navy and Marine Corps priorities. They basically force America to keep its carriers more than a thousand miles from Chinese shores in a fight, and that's a big problem. You see, America's go-to carrier aircraft, the F-35C and the F-A-18 Super Hornet, both have a combat radius of right around 650 miles. In other words, the U.S.'s most potent form of force projection, its carrier strike groups, can no longer reach Chinese targets. But again, even that is a bit of a misleading conclusion because America has shifted these priorities based on the expectation that China will eventually get over the massive technical hurdles associated with targeting a moving vessel at that range. This isn't about something China could do today, it's about something the Pentagon's pretty sure they'll be able to do eventually. And to steal a page right out of Russia's playbook, China can claim that this weapon is operational, but because it was designed really only to engage American aircraft carriers in a global conflict, they're in the favorable position of not having to prove it works. When you put all this together, the modern hypersonic arms race starts to look less like an arms race and more like a semantic debate about how people use terms like in-service and operational. Russia's hypersonic weapons may be operational, but like their Su-57 stealth fighters, their T-14 Armada main battle tanks, or their Uran 9 combat drones, these systems exist in such small numbers that they would have next to no effect on an actual fight. They're really all about perception. And while China's hypersonic weapons do offer strategic value and could theoretically be launched at some sort of target today, there's very little evidence to suggest that they could do what they were designed to do right now. Most experts today are saying it may still be years before China has the ability to accurately target a ship at four-digit ranges, so calling this weapon operational today is really more about optics than it is about capability. Once you realize that Russia and China's hypersonic weapons aren't as dangerous or even as operational as they may seem, America's own efforts don't seem that far behind. Right now, the U.S. expects to have at least three conventionally armed hypersonic boost glide vehicles in service by 2030. These boost glide weapons are the Navy's conventional prompt strike weapon, its sister program the Army's long-range hypersonic weapon, and the Air Force's Arrow. But the U.S. also has two hypersonic scramjet-powered cruise missile programs that are expected to enter service by 2030 as well. All of these weapons will have to be highly reliable and extremely accurate, because they'll be conventionally armed and the U.S. intends to really use them in modern conflicts. The prevailing wisdom within the Pentagon is that there's not much value in just throwing another nuclear weapon onto the stockpile. So America's hypersonic focus has been strictly practical, trying to develop weapons that can be used the minute they enter service in a wide variety of conflicts, from anti-terror operations to reprisal strikes against nations like Syria when they use chemical weapons on civilians, and all the way up to that dreaded World War III scenario that Russia and China's weapons were designed for. The technical challenges associated with developing new kinds of high-speed weapons that you can reliably use on a daily basis in conflicts the world over are so broadly different than the challenges inherent to developing a new nuclear deterrent weapon that comparing these or calling this an arms race isn't really all that accurate. It's more like three different arms races with three different finish lines. Of course, that's not to say that America's been doing everything right. America's hypersonic testing efforts have been hamstrung by a combination of limited testing infrastructure and good old-fashioned bureaucracy. 
With all this talk about hypersonic missiles, you might be surprised to hear that America has only conducted 16 hypersonic missile test launches since 2010. And while most people tend to focus on the fact that only six of those tests were considered a total success, the real problem is that there's only been 16 tests to begin with. A lot of these delays can really just be attributed to a lack of access to the facilities that are needed for the advanced type of weapons America is developing. The U.S. has already earmarked hundreds of millions of dollars to ease this bottleneck, but building infrastructure just takes time. But if it seems to you that the U.S. just isn't in much of a hurry to get these weapons into service, it's because you're right. If this really is an arms race, the U.S. government just sees it in a completely different way than it's usually portrayed in the media. America isn't reliant on foreign weapon sales to fund its defense programs like Russia, and it's already perceived as the world's preeminent military power like China hopes to one day be. So America has nothing to gain by rushing a hypersonic weapon into service, and whether by design or by happenstance, America has effectively chosen to skip today's arms race that takes place mostly in the media and centers around word choices and optics, and instead focus on tomorrow's. Uncle Sam's hypersonic missiles may indeed enter service years behind their competitors in Russia and China, but once they do, that new race begins. Because once everyone has hypersonic weapons in service, it stops being about when you'll get them, and it starts being about what they can actually do, what tactical and strategic capabilities they really provide. The U.S. may have been poorly positioned to win the media's first hypersonic arms race, but it's well positioned to win the second one. And the truth is, that first sprint may have been all about winning headlines, but the second one, while maybe less prestigious, is all about winning wars. There's just a ton more that we could say about hypersonics, and if you're interested, I'll include links below to articles I've written about the weapons that Russia and China have in service, the weapons America is currently developing, and past hypersonic efforts. If you guys would like to see me make videos on any of those topics, please let me know in the comments below, and I'll get to work. And with that ends yet another edition of Air Power from Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. Make sure to swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. If you got anything out of today's video, please make sure to click like and subscribe down below and leave me a comment so I know what I should cover next. And of course, don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.